Perfect. You can go, Stephanie. Got it. I can go. Wonderful. Thank you, Arlie. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I hope that your day has been splendid here. Um, I'm here to talk today about a class that I developed and implemented and experimented with for the very first time last semester, spring semester during the pandemic. You all remember it. Um, I developed it under the umbrella of the Chicago Perform section of the Creative Communities classes that were put together at Columbia um, to bring sophomore, sophomores from across the college together from different areas of study so that they could look at different creative processes, uh, as well as looking at the importance of community in artistic practice and as a whole with, of course, an emphasis on Chicago. Um, I'm a practitioner of theater. I came up in Chicago. I'm always looking for reasons to explore and explain how Chicago theater is bigger than a lot of people think it is. A lot of people can be forgiven for thinking that Chicago stops, Chicago theater anyway, stops at Steppenwolf and the Goodman and Chicago Shakespeare. Maybe a few people have heard of Victory Gardens, but there's a community of roughly 200 tiny theaters in the city, all of them doing fresh work that doesn't have to pander to subscriptions or to ideas about theater. Um, they face extinction daily, except for uh, my old stomping grounds, the Neo Futurarium. The Neo Futurarium uh, continues to flourish. Uh, I was with them when they celebrated their 10th anniversary of Too Much Light Makes the Baby Go Blind, which is an ever-changing experiment uh, uh, to do 30 plays in 60 minutes, written and performed by the ensemble, new material every week. It was a glorious mess, and we played to sold-out houses. Um, it is non-illusory. It is deeply personal. Uh, it's often hilarious, and it's usually a glorious mess. Uh, as I said, I was with them for their 10th anniversary, which was a huge milestone at the time for a nonprofit theater company in Chicago. And now they're celebrating their 30th. So clearly they're doing something right. Uh, they're still doing it. I found my voice there. I have borrowed liberally from their approaches to inform my own approach towards teaching this class. And in all transparency, I also lifted a bunch of stuff from Linda Berry, the cartoon artist and teacher from University of Wisconsin. Um, also a little dab of Marina Abramovich and a lot of Dadaism with a special emphasis on Baroness Elsa von Freytag Loringhoven, who I could go on and on about, but I won't. Uh, in this class, Speed, honesty, topicality, and vulnerability are key. Learning to trust your instincts and to create without boundaries, definitions, or expectations is the goal. This class is called Committing Acts of Theater, and it is mainly concerned with fringe theater, what we call fringe theater in Chicago. Its aim is to provoke and embolden students to create a piece of living work that stems from their own personal stories and to do it without agony or angst. Students are encouraged to think of theater and performance in terms of ritual, in terms of the everyday, in terms of performance of the self, and in terms of a glorious mess. Um, I'm going to show you the PowerPoint that I usually start the class with, because why not? So what is the fringe? It is any art that does not conform to accepted standard dimensions. To be on the fringe is to resist easy assumptions or conclusions. This is a picture actually from a production at the Neo Futurarium from about three years ago called Burning Bluebeard. The fringe for theater is the place where traditional cultures and expectations about the rehearsal room, the stage, and the audience are abandoned in favor of experimentation, the real possibility of failure, the highly personal, the inclusive, and the element of surprise. Pictured here is a production still from Facility Theater Chicago. 
to be on the fringe is to resist easy assumptions or conclusions. I know I said that already. I'm saying it again. It bears repeating. How one recognizes fringe theater? Well, it tends to be underfunded. Uh, it happens in small makeshift theatrical spaces, unexpected theatrical arenas like elevators, cars, soccer fields, basements, public parks, benches. Uh, the audience is usually small and it has uh, an impoverished creative aesthetic by necessity. It's always original material. Pictured here is the Fly Honey Show from Chicago. And on the right is uh, still from The Infinite Wrench, what used to be Too Much Light Makes the Baby Go Blind at the Neo Futurarium. Fringe theater sometimes asks these questions. Why do we often think the stories of others are valid and our own are not? Why do we often fear a stranger until we've heard their story? Why do we think a story has to have uh, exposition, rising action, a climax, a resolution, and a denouement? Why is, that, why is that a rule? Where did it come from? And why is the audience way over there? And why are they so quiet? And why are they in the dark? And why am I so unsatisfied by a lot of theater? And what is theater? And importantly, why am I doing this theater for no money? It also asks, why are there so many straight white male protagonists on the stage? Where are all the LGBTQ plus stories? Where are all the BIPOC stories? Can we do better? Yeah, we can. It asks the question, why do we have to rent a theater? Especially if we don't have the budget and most of us don't. Is it theater if it's in my living room? You might ask yourself, who is that human on the first page of the syllabus and why are they there? Uh, for those who don't know, this is a picture of Claude Cahoon. They were uh, an important artist in the 30s and 40s, uh, a progenitor really of Cindy Sherman, but also not just a photographer, uh, a performance artist and a provocateur. Some of the theaters we discuss and visit either virtually or I'm hoping next semester for real, our Theater Ublek, the Neo Futurarium, Silent Theater, Hell in a Handbag, Trapdoor Theater, Nothing Without a Company. I'm hoping to rope in about Face Theater as well this coming semester. It might be easier now that we're out of a, a pandemic. Um, who knows? Uh, so these are all Chicago theaters that make up the fringe community. And there's a lot that I have not uh, addressed. Okay, screen sharing has stopped. Good, so in this class, we briefly look at theater history, but we mostly spend the first five weeks discovering how the students themselves think of theater, articulating it, figuring it out together, how to, how to define it for themselves so that it's more approachable and more malleable and more personal, how to make theater into what they want theater to be. To do this, we start by steering away from theater altogether and diving into the act of broad artistic practices. Most of these students are non-theater majors and they get a little nervous uh, about theater. They're afraid they're gonna be asked to perform. So we take that away from them right away and make them nervous about something else. Uh, each class session starts with a blank piece of paper and a handful of crayons and every student draws a picture of themselves as they feel they are that day. Uh, they have five minutes to do this. And then the bell rings and they have to stop. Now the fine art students love this. I've discovered the others are as terrified as if I'd asked them to just do a monologue from Coriolanus. Um, and then they, when they finish, they put the pictures on a table and everyone can look at the pictures Inevitably, someone apologizes and says they can't draw, to which I reply, you just did, which is sort of a dad joke, uh, but it leads to one of the most important concepts of the class, which is that there is no good, there is no bad, there is no right, there is no wrong. There is only, I made a mark today. It's my mark and no one else could have made it and here it is. I like to look at it as a proof of existence. 
By the end of the semester, then they will have a visual record of the arc of their emotional life uh, because I will put them together, the pictures, and hand them back so they can take a look at it. Um, a snapshot, a snap book of images, if you will. Um, one of the other things that I've noticed about our students is they don't like the word artist. It's gotten a bad rap. So for the course of this class, they are invited to uh, adopt the title and see what happens and to articulate what the word means to each of us. And I ask a few leading questions and the, the, the idea comes around to the, to the fact that, um, not the fact, the approach that an artist is not someone who is lofty and removed, but merely someone who pays attention. The artist is someone who pays attention and daily life offers many opportunities to practice being an artist. The learning curve for the class is the realization that paying attention takes work and we're not used to doing it. Uh, so the next assignment is what I like to call the amazing eight minute journal. Um, five days a week, I ask the students to keep a journal in which they spend eight minutes three minutes writing down something they saw, three minutes writing down something they did. Well, six or seven things they saw, six or seven things they did, one minute writing down something they heard someone say, and one minute drawing a quick picture of something. And again, it doesn't matter if you don't think you can draw. They do this, it's handwritten, not on a computer. They're gonna hand in the journal at the end of the semester. Um, it gets us in the habit of hearing, seeing, and remembering the world around us. Um, some students really take to the practice, some resist it. If they start to commit to it, then they recognize that every day people say things that are both profound or silly or profoundly silly. They start to notice the details of their day. Um, they start to see the poetry behind the odd detail. And they begin to morph into an observer of the flow of their own life. Students bring these journals to class and the first couple of minutes, well, 15 minutes or so of class after our portraits, we gather into groups and we read some of these lists out loud. What often emerges is that the listeners discover that the simplest details resonate with them, touch them, make them see things. This usually surprises the artist who came up with the list. Um, it's also a really nice icebreaker and a great way to spend 15 minutes just building community. We spend a lot of time in groups, free writing timed responses to prompts, always timed in order to stop folks from sitting and agonizing and thinking, thinking, thinking. There's a big emphasis on producing, 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 and we'll do the thinking later. Um, and in this way, they start to gather material for a personal solo piece, which they present at the end of the fifth week. This is an assignment to create a one to three minute piece in which they reveal themselves. Uh, the assignment makes it clear that they don't have to speak if they don't want to, they don't have to write anything. Um, it just needs to sustain itself for at least one minute, them in space, knowing that people are watching them. And they should think of it as theater. On the day it's due, folks either do it live in person or they can videotape it and we share all the pieces and we have a party. I'm gonna show you um, one of my favorites. It's very, very short. Um, this student had a hard time looking at anybody. And I think this is why I really appreciate this piece from them. Share. Full screen, here we go. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Did you say lesbian? So that was one piece. Um, I'm kind of running out of time and I want to show you one other short piece that I feel is very important. Um, this was a student who had a really hard time connecting in class. And when they were given the assignment to um, work with either someone else or a group of people, they managed to connect with a filmmaker in the class. And they're a, a animation student, as you will soon see. Um, and I'm just going to play it right now so that I can make sure we get to it and then the rest of it, I'll fill in with all the other things. Let's see here. You. A moment. Hmm? Some would define themselves by the moment things went bad. You mean when I was like two and my pathetic excuse for mother was like, hey, this heroin thing looks cool. No, fuck that bitch. She doesn't deserve the satisfaction of having any impact on my life. So what about the moment things went good? No, that one's kind of hard to define. One day you just wake up and you're like, oh, wait, you're telling me I have hobbies now? And friends? Where did you people even come from? So, uh, okay, what if it's neither? What if it's the moments people forget? Like when people use your real pronouns and it's not a big deal. Or when people find out that some sounds make you itchy and proceed to keep making them until you draw blood. And then they treat you like you're subhuman because of it. I can't erase that. Whoops. Okay, this, this actually kind of hurts. Okay, this should be better. Um, compliments. Those are important moments. They keep you up late, wondering if they're real or just jokes. Oh, sometimes people will hang out and it's probably not out of pity. Okay, is my life so tainted by jerk assery that I can't believe in goodness? I, I can't do this anymore. Okay, so I have to wrap up because it's uh, been 20 minutes, 
the hope is that by the end of the semester, uh, the romantic mystification of producing work has worn off and the students are comfortable with the idea of a first draft sort of laboratory where they can manifest initial impulses and ideas in a way that results in a physical product with the support of diverse voices and community within the classroom. Thank you for viewing some of their work and for listening. And if anyone has a question or wants to talk, you should feel free. You can do questions in the chat or comments, or you can just unmute, I think, if you want to speak. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, um, I really enjoy this, this class because I get to hear their voices. I get to uh, a little glimpse behind the curtain, as it were, which I'm always interested in, especially as a fellow artist who works from their own personal life. So Stephanie, you had um, visits to performances at various French theaters around Chicago. So what did you do during the COVID restrictions? Um, I did a lot of uh, showing of clips. Mm -hmm. um, I showed a lot of work uh, from various theaters that I got my hands on. And I also, I worked uh, pretty extensively with Helena Handbag, which is uh, Chicago's preeminent uh, drag theater. And I had one of their folks come in all masked up and show a piece of their work on video and then talk with the students and take questions. Um, so I, and you know, I didn't really want to bring too many people into the classroom as that seemed a little dicey at the time, but there's a yeah. lot of material out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Arlie. So uh, I'm curious if there were challenges in, in terms of connecting the students to, you know, the sort of ephemeral nature of fringe theater around and, you know, how, you know, I'm thinking of this from a Chicago collections sort of perspective where you try to connect the cultural artifacts and history and, and some sort of preservation there. Are there places that you tend to look for or tend to go to um, uh, uh, both in, in terms of like, you know, for finding, but also to refer to students for research? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, I have been, for me, it all starts with, uh, as I said, we don't spend too much time in history because I'm not a historian. I dabble, but I like to start by uh, turning the students attention to the work of the Dada culture, you, you know, that happened around the First World War. Um, and then if at all possible, we sort of veer into punk a little bit because the Dadaist, as you know, you're nodding, were for me the original punks. Um, and then I, uh, yeah, I, I give them access to to theaters around town who do that sort of work. Um, you know, their, their uh, websites, websites are wonderful things during a pandemic. Um, and my own personal experiences with art. The thing about the ephemeral, the thing, the thing about the theater is it is ephemeral, right? And it's one of the things that uh, it can be both very beautiful and very frustrating because all of my work, I don't, I don't know where it is. Uh, and I was a crappy, crappy documentarian back in the day, and I'm still not that great. Um, but if you look, you can find, I mean, you can find stuff on JSTOR, frankly. Um, and our library has a great, great, thank you, Arlie. Our library has a, a great collection of different types of theater. Anything else? I don't mean to hog the questions as the as the uh, moderator, but I, I'm interested in how you draw connections between what we saw that your students did mm -hmm. personally and what they observe in the fringe theater. Sure. Um, well, the fringe theater that I'm talking about tends to come from personal experience, and it's not. It's as I said, non-illusory. 
So in other words, no one's up there trying to pretend that they're in Moscow. They're always in a theater. Um, it's rough theater, as Peter Brook would say. Uh, it's urgent. And um, it's, uh, it's, uh, they can do it simply by standing in front of a group of people. I, I like to subscribe to the old idea of Peter Brook that for theater to be theater, all it needs to be is one person walking into a space in front of a group of people. And then it is theater. The fun part for me, and for some of these students, at least, I think, is that we start with what they think theater is, and then we break it down. Because a lot of them, their experience of theater is wicked, you know, which is a great experience. But there's red velvet curtains and red velvet seats and a proscenium and a huge orchestra and all the money in the world thrown at it. Um, or they tend to think of like film. Um, in which they tr we are bamboozled into thinking that things are really happening. Um, this is a nice introduction to the idea of theater as uh, uh, a place to be where something is actually happening right now, right in front of you, and no one is trying to pull the wool over your eyes. There's uh, my theater, the theater that I like, uh, there is magic, but the magic is not in convincing people that we are, uh, again, in Moscow. I keep going back to Chekhov. I love Chekhov. I've got nothing against Chekhov. When it's done well, it's so great. Um, but, you know, a lot of theaters doing Chekhov in town were not getting audiences, whereas at the Neo Futurarium, we were sold out every weekend. And I kept asking myself, why are the young people especially coming to see this? It's theater because it's in front of people, but it's topical, it's urgent, it's people speaking the truth. Um, and we don't get that very often. So that's what I try to do in class is get them to just speak their minds without thinking about it too hard. I really believe in um, art without angst, which doesn't mean it can't be thoughtful. It just means you don't need to get all bloody about it. Unless you're doing Titus Andronicus. So just a reminder that there is uh, there are two sessions that start at 2.30. Um, this conversation can continue, no problem, but if you wanted to attend one of those, you'll need to uh, cross on to, to one of those presentations. So. Hey, hey, Ste yeah. hey, Steph, I have a, a quick question. I've been thinking about Devin's question about, about yeah. you know, what, what do you capture in the like, ephemerate, ephemeral nature of theater and all that. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's a thought about, um, you know, like, what of the ephemera do you capture of, and, and is it different for different kinds of performances? You know, like the, the neo-futurists have a lot of two, two minute plays, right? That, that are that are compiled in books, right? So that the texts have been, right? Or people may have video or people may have audio or people may have a journal or PP, right? Mm -hmm. Like, or, or drawings. And I'm wondering if, if like, I don't know, I just, it just struck me as like maybe, you, you can't capture it, right? Because it's an I ephemeral see. thing, but you but there is maybe something, I don't know, concrete that leads to the, I don't know, the ephemera. I just, I just like Devin's question was, yeah. was real, you know, and I just been thinking about it a little bit. So I'm just yeah. wondering if you explore that at all. It's resonating with me too. And that's one of the reasons I really like them to keep that journal. Yeah. Because for me, that journal is like, this is a record of your days. I mean, hell, my past is ephemeral. Yeah. And I've got three children to prove that I existed. And yet still, I can't remember two weeks ago. But I documented it, not in a thorough way, but in a way of just like objects that caught my eye, snatches of conversation. Um, I think object work, Brian, for instance, oh if you have a piece of theater that centers itself around a beloved object that you have, or even a not beloved object that becomes important to you through the work, then you always have that object. Um, as, a, as a diarist, you know, um, I, I, have, I have 
hundreds of pounds of notebooks cluttering up the garage right now. Um, and, and yeah, it's different for everybody. But I, I do think there is something to be said for having some sort of material thing that you can hold on to from the experience. And this is why I'm so psyched by the fact that so many of these students know how to use their iPhones. Right. <laughs> you know, all of this stuff exists on YouTube right now. And I think if nothing else, this might um, this this might turn out some more interesting TikToks than we've been treated to in the past. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I, I think to build upon that, I mean, like on on the one hand, you know, I'm as a you know, librarian, I'm also I'm also interested in like what how can we help students, you know, uh, preserve and you know raise the sort of um, uh, their, their ability to share um, their, their, their work and their, their growth and et cetera, like mm -hmm. through those sort of documents, like, you know, shared repositories and, and those sort of things, things that are easily uploadable and then have a permanent DOI so they don't go away when right. the top folds up or, what, or, or whatever. Um, but I'm also interested in this because of the sort of, you know, how, how do we raise, I mean, I, I, obviously, you know, my wife uh, is Caitlin Blackwell. She says hello to you both. Um, she's oh, uh, Caitlin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Tell her I miss her. <laughs> I will. She's she's grateful for your uh, uh, reference letter for library school. Um, oh, but uh, but, uh, but from a a, a, a cultural um, organization sort of. Um, uh, perspective, like we, you know, we've been trying, Chicago Collections has been trying to work with Chicago Cultural Alliance, because there's a lot of small, like, dance studios and other things that, like, want to preserve and raise the status of their um, visibility, you know, and, and, and document their history, but have, don't have 